think reimagining the movement to end gender violence means reimagining what we understand as gender violence. I think if you ask most people the first thing that comes to mind when they say gender violence, as I often do when I'm speaking, they'll say domestic violence increasingly in the midst of the national conversation we're having about uh, sexual violence that was sparked by hashtag Me Too and has been moving forward by activists like to get Toronto Burke and others for many, many years. Uh, people will now say sexual assault or campus sexual assault or um, sexual violence, and it tends to stop there. And then when we think of gender violence, we tend to focus that conversation on cisgender, heterosexual um, women who are imagined to be citizens of the United States, and we're not thinking about all the ways in which gender violence is actually all the ways in which gender norms and gender binaries are enforced and that those forms of violence really um, target people who are gender non-conforming, who are transgender, who are non-binary, who don't conform to gender norms, and also folks who don't conform to sort of general notions of white womanhood. And we're not thinking of the violence, uh, economic violence, the fact that um, women, and particularly black women and native women, um, have the highest rates of poverty in this country, the lowest uh, incomes, the highest unemployment rates. And, and we're just not sort of thinking of that as an ongoing form of violence. We might know about pay gaps. We might know um, that, you know, women earn 64 cents or 78 cents or wherever we are on the dollar, but we're not thinking about kind of the structural economic violence that uh, women are facing. And then when we think of gender violence, we tend to focus that conversation on cisgender, heterosexual. I will often give talks where I will speak for 45 minutes about various forms and cases and contexts and manifestations of police violence against women, trans, gender nonconforming people, pregnant people, uh, mothers, um, and so forth, and then at the end say, you know, how many of you, when I asked what gender-based violence was, thought of any of the things that I've just been talking about for 45 minutes, and generally people say no, um, because they just are not thinking of the state as a perpetrator of gender-based violence in the U.S., when in fact they might see that in other parts of the world and even be activated by that in other parts of the world, but they're not seeing the very same things that are happening in the U.S. as gender-based violence. And so... For instance, people might be, you know, concerned about rape by police officers, say, in India, but they won't be concerned about rape by police officers in Oklahoma and, um, and in New York City and in their town because it's quite pervasive and widespread. And so um, we need to expand our understanding of gender-based violence to the carceral state, to the very institutions that we, um, as mainstream kind of society, have been lifting up and pointing to and growing and building and directing people to as the response to gender-based violence, that in fact they are among the primary perpetrators of gender-based violence um, and certainly are doing nothing to end gender-based violence. So I think for me, expanding the conversation on gender-based violence must absolutely include and become a conversation about the carceral state and about the process of criminalization itself as a form of gender-based violence and as a failed response to gender-based violence. Women are the fastest growing prison population, including trans and gender nonconforming people. Uh, in fact, many people are familiar with the statistic that one in three black men will face incarceration in their lifetime. Many people are not familiar with the statistic that one in two black trans women will face incarceration in their lifetime. Um, people don't know, again, about the disproportionate representation of queer folks in women's facilities. They don't know that almost half of people in women's jails and um, uh, a third of people in prisons for women experience some kind of disability. Um, so people who are trying to get women out of those situations are, are recognizing the state as a source and site of and criminalization and, and policing in prisons and punishment in jails as a source and site. At, at Interrupting Criminalization Research and Action, we have been focusing on trying to figure out not just who's in prison, which is, I think, where the conversation has been around women's incarceration, but how they got there. And to look at what are the arrest patterns and policing patterns, particularly. I think people have looked at the conditions that produce uh, criminalization and gender-based violence, and they've looked at the outcome, which is who's in prison and for what, but they haven't necessarily looked as much at the process. And so we're really looking, for instance, that are like, what are the top 
five arrest offenses for women, trans and gender nonconforming people in this country. The first one is theft, people taking things they need. That's a product of economic gender-based violence, or it's a product of people taking stuff in the context of gender-based violence, where they're in a relationship where violence is occurring and they're being sent to take the thing, steal the thing. Um, recognizing that gender-based violence is producing poverty is, um, that poverty is a form of gender-based violence and that that's putting people into prisons and jails where they're experiencing gender-based violence, saying we're gonna bail people out, we're not gonna let their poverty continue to keep them in a site of gender-based violence, and then we're gonna figure out how we're gonna address the thing that got them in there in the first place is one kind of campaign that people are looking at all the forms of gender-based violence. Another is survived and punished, um, led by many folks from Insight um, and Mariam Kaba and others, uh, where we're looking at how self-defense uh, and sort of your own response to gender-based violence in the face of the state's failure to respond to gender-based violence or to protect you from it will land you inside prison or jail because you may defend yourself through survived and punished and again interrupting criminalization. We're trying to look at how exactly that criminalization happens. What are the police doing when they show up to a scene where someone has defended themselves and how is it that they're coming to the conclusion that the person who defended themselves and is a survivor of violence is the person who should be punished for it? Um, and how are prosecutors making those decisions and how can we interrupt that process? And then, you know, another initiative that, um, or another way that people are addressing gender-based violence around the country is simply by trying to interrupt this process of criminalization generally and decriminalize. So there are campaigns in New York and DC to decriminalize uh, prostitution-related offenses. In Atlanta, a group of black women who are survivors of the Atlanta City Jail, including black trans women, are trying to just decriminalize all public order offenses. They're just saying you shouldn't be criminalized for loitering, standing, sitting, being, peeing, pooping, <laughs> littering, being in a public uh, transit facility, doing all these things in public because you have nowhere else to go and nowhere else to do it and that's what you're having to do to survive. Those efforts are efforts to address the gender-based violence that's happening in the streets and the communities and families and homes that are pushing people out onto the street, uh, the economic violence that's pushing people out on the street and into the sites of police officers who are then responding with more violence, more criminalization, and more punishment, and trying to figure out how to address all of that through really challenging the process of criminalization itself and, and who it targets and why and how those decisions are made, and then um, looking to other ways of responding to need, um, harm, and conflict in society.